And I think with, you know, graffiti at first, it was kind of like a little taste of something that, you know, it was more of a release of an expression and not so much trying to pin down and have everything, yeah. you know, down to the T. But once I got into design, I think that's why I enjoyed it because it was like, okay, now I have, everything has to be mm. precise. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, we have a long overdue part two with Sam Vasquez. Our first chat was in 2016 on episode number 15. So 160 shows later, we're catching up with our friend here in Indianapolis in my dining room. Now, if you're watching the YouTube feed, you will see no more of me after the first question or so because dummy forgot to empty the card. However, we got lots of Sam on the video, and if you're listening to the audio version, you're not going to notice any difference. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with my friend and just an awesome creative, Sam Vasquez. Okay, kids, here we are for part two from Indianapolis with Sam Vasquez. Sam it's good to have you back. Yeah, thank you. It's been quite a few years. It's, it has been quite a few yeah, years. It's like yeah. three houses later for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this is the first time I've ever recorded in my own uh, dining room at the cool. new place. Yeah. So you are, are helping me get that started. Um, last time we talked to you, we focused a lot on kind of the style writing and graffiti stuff. Um, I've got a painting of yours hanging over my yeah, shoulder so here. It's always I, good to see paintings I've done yeah. years ago, you know, like... <laughs> living in somebody else's space and, you know, making, uh, bringing some joy yeah. in, in that. So that's, that was great. So you are a multi-talented guy. You mm -hmm. do a lot of different things. And when people ask me about you or when people <laughs> ask me about this painting, this yeah. is when you come up the most often people walk into my house and they see that and they're like, that's amazing. Where'd that come from? Who's the, who's the, who's the artist? Mm -hmm. And they're like, so what does he do? So this is, this is the big question to you. Yeah. How, how do you answer that question today when people are like, Sam, what are you up to these days? What, what do you do? Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of more leaning into the word creative. Um, because even in abstract painting, there's creativity that goes behind. Some people think it's just like very random, but you have to plan it and actually even do research and all those things to study color. So that's a lot of creative um, things that go into making a painting also. Yeah. So the word creative kind of fits better. Um, I know you have to kind of like define certain roles like creative director or, you know, visual artist or electronic musician, just so people can, can exactly see what the media that you're using or the outcome or the output, but everything is just creativity. And you're doing all those things. <laughs> I'm doing a lot. <laughs> I'm doing a lot, but I'm, I'm also kind of like taking more time to, to kind of like spread, you know, like more time in between some of the projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, one of the publications that I started about two years ago from me, shoot three and four is going to come out. It's been almost a year. So it, tell our listeners what the title of the publication is. Oferta. Yeah. O F F E R T A, which means it's a gift in Italian. Um, so we're, it's like an offering. So you're giving all this uh, creativity and, and it features people from all over the world, which is really cool. Yeah. So how do you determine who to feature in your publications? It's curated. So I, you know, I, I work with Ayana Tibbs, who's another younger, uh, almost creative like myself. She sings, she does, um, uh, art, she does, um, graphic design and all sorts of things. So we, it was during the shutdown, we kind of sat down at a Starbucks one day and say, Hey, what? what project we would like to work during this time. Yeah. And that came about. That's very cool. And so how often are you publishing that? Or is it just sort of like, as you get one? It started more like si every six months, then it was quarterly. And it's like, oh, this is taking too much of my time with other projects. And now it's kind of occasionally. Um, but I know that it's more of a project. So after like, I think right now issue seven mm -hmm. might be it. Mm. With seven being the number of completion, I have all these things with numbers and what things, uh, the meaning of things. Yeah. And I'm not one to do something for an extended period of time because it takes a lot. Yeah. Uh, what is it about seven that makes that special? Uh, you know, you know, if you, if you're a person of faith, 
Yeah. You'll, you'll get what? Seven. The yeah. number seven, uh, which is a number of completion. Oh, very cool. Yep. Totally makes sense. Um, so last time we talked to you, right after that, you went into a pretty major thing. Tell our yeah, audience a little yeah. bit about that experience. So uh, just a few months after we, we talked for, um, on the podcast, I was called to, um, to be part of uh, Sirius Canvas, which is an exhibit that opened at uh, now New Fields um, here in Indianapolis. Yeah, that and used to be the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and they changed that name a couple of years ago. And it was back. during kind of like the introduction of that exhibit. Uh -huh. So everything, a few, probably my months before everything was like Indianapolis Museum of Art. And all of a sudden, it's like new fields. People were like, did they change venues for this exhibit? <laughs> I was like, no, the venue changed names. Um, but what City Scambus, uh brought was a collection of early graffiti-inspired work into Canvas. Because one thing people have to realize is like once you took it out of the context of like a subway car or a wall, yeah, in a sense it's no longer graffiti, yeah, because it's, it it it's out of the elements mm -hmm. that created graffiti. So Martin Wong, who uh, used to work at an art store in New York, and meeting younger graffiti artists, he started collecting the work. So after he passed, he gave the collection to the Museum of the City of New York. Mm. And that's what it was brought in. Uh, very cool. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I feel like we're probably skipping some things, but um, not long after that, you were back in New York. Not really. A few years after that. Yeah. So this was uh, City of Scam was happening in 2017. Yeah. Um, but... It's interesting, even the backstory of how City of Canvas happened, because there's a lot of things. And I, I was in a museum talk and mentioned this, that oftentimes it's because another museum did something similar. And then this museum will say, hey, that was successful. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So probably like a year before that, uh, Indiana State Museum opened a show called like 317 Meets. Um, I forgot the zip code over in Hammond or uh, East Chicago, I think. Mm -hmm. With the Sisa crew, who's uh, Ish Muhammad, they're like the earliest graffiti crew in Indiana. So the Indiana State Museum put that exhibit; it was very successful. And here comes City of Canvas, which you know New York had it. They publicized publicized it, and New Fields picked it up. Yeah. So that's kind of like how it came about. Um. So that was. 2016, when I heard about it and couldn't talk about it for a whole year, which is kind of like, uh, this is, <laughs> this is happening. And I was seeing some of the behind the, the scenes of making it, um, you know, new fields was like, Hey, is there any writers in New York that we can speak about, speak to, and you know, they can share more insights. So they got in touch with crash and days, uh, Sefer, lady pink, say Adams. And those are the ones who came over for the talk Yeah, for the opening. Very cool. And yeah. so um, back in New York for your 94 thing. What was that again? You, you were back in New York in 2019, right? 2019. Yeah. And that was actually, is, is uh, so right after CDS Canvas, I did a, a solo exhibition in 924, which you, you were able to come to that. Yeah. And it was good seeing you there. Um, you know, it's a supporter and, 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 and uh, always encouraging my work. Um, so right after that, I got the Creative Renewal Arts Fellowship from the, um, uh, the Arts Council of Indianapolis. And through that, the project was to go to New York and do research, mm -hmm. which is now it's materializing like years later because research takes time. Mm. So I was able to go out there for like a week in 2018, I think. No, 2019. So I went out there in the spring of 2019, met with Snake One who's a first generation writer, Al Diaz, who uh, did Seymour with Basquiat, mm. part one, and Say Adams. And then was also able to like uh, go back to the history of New York and where graffiti first started and some of the important places like Subway Yards and uh, Rocksteady Park, mm -hmm. where Rocksteady crew, uh, breaking crew used to practice. So that was kind of like my first going back to New York and taking an extensive look at the places and the people. 
Yeah. And you were telling me before we hit record here, say Adams mm -hmm. is a pretty interesting yeah, character in the yeah, kind yeah. of the cultural background there. He is. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, Polina Osharov through Pattern brings him, you know, every so often, and he does a lot of talks here in town, but uh, he was part of uh, City of Canvas. And he said, hey, if you're ever in their city, get in touch. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that kind of gave me a sense of why the culture is the way the culture is. It's very open. Um, I myself, I'm like that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it till I was like, oh my God, this is just like back in the days where people are saying, hey, go see this person. Mm -hmm. When you're in town, come see me. And we take care of each other in that sense. That's cool. And Say was involved with? Yeah. So I visited in spring. And uh, it's kind of interesting because <clears throat> I believe in, in kind of like what we're talking, just letting things flow, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had scheduled to go see him at his studio. And he said, hey, I have, you know, something came up. Can you come a little later? Like probably two, three hours later. And I said, okay, cool. No problem. So I get there. I visit with him. And right after, you know, I was about to leave, he said, hey, before you leave, I got to introduce you to his name is Bernardo Navarro Tomas, a uh, Cuban artist. He said he works for the Cuban uh, Cultural Center next door. Mm. I'm like, OK, cool. Met him, talked with him. And next thing you know, we started communicating. And I told him, yeah, I've been wanting to get back to New York and Berlin. He's like, you know what? The Cuban space has another space in another floor in this building that is empty. If if you're up to it, you know, and you can make it into a gallery and studio space, we can use it. Yeah. Super so just cool. like that, there was this available space. Now I have to get there, right? <laughs> so I'm here in Indy going, okay, what, you know, what's going to happen? How am I going to get there? Within a month after that, get an email from former chair, Joel Mason, City Tech. Hey, be, we've been wanting for you to come teach at the school. Something mm. opened up. Talk to this person, which you've talked to him, uh, Douglas. Yeah, Doug, Davis. Douglas Davis. And so I spoke with him on the phone. And so on a Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I got a job. I had to be there on Tuesday morning. So that was another thing where it's just like you just let things flow, right? Yeah. And opportunities open. But just by being able to just share and, and being available for those things. I was telling a friend last week that some days I feel like Forrest Gump because I feel like I'm connected to all these people I shouldn't be <laughs> yeah. connected to. <laughs> and I think, I mean, I was, as I was, you know, driving up here, I'm, I'm thinking about that, like, wow, me and Josh go way back <laughs> just by being in a space where in, in, you know, just connecting to yeah. each other. And I think that that's, that's always been a big thing with me. It's like, do not be afraid, right? you know, because sometimes we, we feel like, oh, that person will never take my email. Mm hmm or I will not, you know, if, if I see somebody that I would like to work with or collaborate or just to get to know, it's like, just go up to them, introduce yourself. So, I mean, th there's so much power in that. Yeah. You know, one of the, I think, really valuable things for me personally, and maybe for other people are like, duh, but from doing this show and from talking to, you know, quote unquote, famous creative people is you learn that they're just, they're still people and you yeah, can, you yeah. can, you know, be cool and just talk to them and have a conversation. And most of the time people are going to be cool back. And, yeah. um, and, and that's been one of the most valuable lessons for me, just how easy it is to interact I, with people just because you like mm -hmm. them and admire them and they do great work. Doesn't mean you can't go talk to exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I don't know who was the person that said this, but I, I heard it years ago and I prescribed to it where the person says, well, fame is just a perception of who you think I am. Mm. Which, you know, being creative and, and what we do in branding or, you know, design and everything, we, we can put a good face on almost anything, right? Right. We can package it to the point where it's like it feels untouchable mm -hmm. and it feels like so separate because, like, oh, it looks this way, so it must be this way. So understanding that it's, it's just a perception of who the person is. Yeah. Because we might think it could be the greatest person, but then it turns out it's not. <laughs> so their goals are bubble gets you know, burst. Right. right. So the whole idea of like, just look at the person behind the image and get yeah. to know the person. Yeah. I think I heard Paula share once say that being a famous graphic designer is sort of like being a famous dentist. Like <laughs> if you're not a dentist, yeah. you don't know exactly who the famous graphic designers are. 
exactly. uh, which is just hilarious. Um, and so you all, you kind of touched on this for half a second, but we haven't talked about this in a long mm-hmm. time, but you're kind of in the music space too. Yeah. I'm, I'm like behind a mask. Yeah. Right. right? <laughs> you, so you're like a little incognito. Yeah. Um, tell our listeners a little bit about what you're up to in the music world. Well, um, you know, errors and lovers. I think last time yeah. I didn't, I didn't say exactly what was the project. I just yeah. said for those who know, they know, cause I, it's more <laughs> of sharing it yeah. and more of a, for me, it's, uh, therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my mom passed, passed away a few years ago of Alzheimer's and yeah. towards the end, she will come up to the studio and just play with the keyboards and stuff. And yeah. I got some cool videos of her doing that, but I saw how her, she lit up. Yeah. So, you know, understanding that that's something in my family that, you know, my grandfather passed of Alzheimer's as well, you know, that kind of like sparked something in my brain to keep it going, Mm -hmm. uh, just like reading or, or things like that. So, um, you know, I come from a musical family, but I'm one of those who was like, I don't want to learn music. So (laughs) I think with the advent of, um, digital music and all that, it's just like Mm -hmm. picking it up and then learning certain keys and what works together with what and tempo and also kind of like, you know, creativity, looking at a track and saying, how do I want it to go? Yeah. Right. The more I go now I have, it's not a formula, but, but I'm understanding, uh, um, through a friend of mine, you probably heard of him, uh, um, Rick Diaz Granados, who's a designer, artist, photographer, he used to run a record label, a mm-hmm. micro record label. He said, Hey, I know you're laying out the track, but look at, you know, like the verse, the chorus, the verse of mm-hmm. chorus bridge. So 16 bars, four or eight. So yeah. now if you look at the tracks I've done the last couple of years, it's like, Oh, 16 bars. Yeah. Oh, here comes this. But then I can flip it and say, well, the second verse, I might split it, uh, you know, like eight bars for the verse and then the other four could be a bridge Mm -hmm. or something else. So more of the structure. Yeah. But not allowing it to kind of take away from creativity or just exploring. Well, it's interesting that you came into the music sort of just as a pure artist without the formal Mm -hmm. training, without the instrumental. Yeah. And And I've had like, like, oh, well, maybe there, this could be improved if I learned some of the structure. Yeah. And I think it's more of, because it's even with like painting or anything, it's like, you can do something so abstract that people will kind of go like, what the heck? (laughs) You know, it's like somehow people have to connect with it. Yeah. You know, not everybody's going to, because that's a reality. Right. Any, anything that's to this truest form cannot be pop. Yeah. Right. Like everything that's, you know, and some people say, why are you going to say, you know, you're what, why are you going to, but anything that, has such an, um, a huge amount of following, it, it, it gets stripped from the truth because it's like, now it, it, it's watered down in a sense, yeah. right? So, but I understand that I got to connect. I cannot go to where it's like, oh, the only person listening to me is me. So I'm only speaking to myself, right? Yeah. So, you know, with music, that's one thing that I'm looking at and learning. Um, it's interesting because last night I was listening to some old tracks and some like really experimental stuff mm-hmm. where I was like, oh, that bass is so high, but it sounds good. So now <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of releasing, which I already have the, the titles of the ones I want to release. It's probably like 10 tracks mm-hmm. and it could be everything from like, it sounds like punk rock and hip hop together. And oh, that's interesting. It. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, this is like public enemy or. <laughs> like um Ice T when he did that cop killer song. Oh yeah. Where it was like rock music and I was like, okay, I need to put more sounds on here so I yeah. can bring it up. So it's gonna be a very experimental record. Um, which you know, some people go like, huh? But that's where I started. So it's kinda interesting to go back to those beginnings and release some of that earlier. It's funny stuff. that you said on your last your last time you were here that you said something about the music. Like if you know, you know, because you know, Sam will send me a, an Instagram direct message and I'm sure that's how you share it with a lot of people. Yeah. Just, you know, I never know when it's coming. I never know what to expect, but it's just like, here's a new thing that I'm working on. Here's a new piece of music. And one of the things, uh, 
I felt like there's a story here and we don't have to go into the details if you don't want, but you shared uh, something about a, a recording artist. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think I mentioned on the last, I say like, yeah. Hey, there was this person, blah, blah, and share a song with Prince and Prince got, went like, Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah. Um, and with that specific, I will not mention the name Yeah, because it's one of those things where she was respectful. Well, I'm going to see people already know the gender, <laughs> but you know, she was respectful enough not to put me in certain spaces because I take after my dad. My dad was a very private person and, you know, everybody says, you, you reminds me of him. Mm. And I think that that's the space where I'd like to operate more on behind the scenes. Yeah. But in this record, I just share with her and her team, like, Hey, why don't you play the bass guitar? Like, like an actual guitar. So mm -hmm. it will have more riffs and solos. Tried it. It was interesting. Yeah. So that was the thing that she shared with Prince and Prince was like, wow, this is really interesting. And there's a lot of more people that probably have done it. It was just the way they yeah. did it. Um, and the play bass player left it. Cause it's like, oh wow. Yeah. I'm getting to, I get to play a little more. <laughs> play a little more, get up up front, especially on a song that can maybe be considered pop. Mm -hmm. Right. And even that, that's one thing I've learned about a lot of industry people, right? Like when you listen to what is being created now, years ago it was probably underground. Yeah. So they're looking at people who are there doing things. Yeah. And being connected in those circles uh, is really interesting. Like this person's engineer one time told me, like, how you know all this stuff? How are you? How are you? <laughs> because, you know, in particular, she, I probably mentioned her name, not her full name, but she will get a kick out of this because uh, her name is Anne. Mm -hmm. without an E. Yeah. So she knows who she is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say. She was like, this is really interesting. Cause in a sense, if you look at it, people who are in the industry, as far as like day in, day out, putting yeah. stuff, working with different artists, they don't have time to look underground. All right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they're in meetings, they're studio sessions. Those things are machines. Yeah. So checking to, their email like everybody else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's one of those things where like, you know, having that input was great. Yeah. Um, you know, and just bringing a certain element of humor to what they do. Cause their work could be very rigid, very, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, there's tons of people behind what they do. So they're, they're very on time on everything. So to have a more of a approach of like explore, why not mm -hmm. try it? Yeah. Um, you know, it's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, one name you probably can drop, you've been working on this or finished up this book project. Mm -hmm. Tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about the oh, book. Oh yeah. So it's, yeah. it's a book and, uh, right now it's, it's in the printer cause yeah. then, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, those who have work in design recognize like, oh my God, this has to be reprinted or oh my, because it has to be, you know, a good product is, yeah. uh, a book about, it, it touches on 10 films. In some of the life of Sidney Pollack, mm -hmm. who's, you know, uh, born in Indiana, um, who's a, a film, um, director, actor, producer, and it's called, uh, Sidney Pollack is a subliminal existentialist. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting title, but I was able to work on that book for the book cover and also do some of the interior, um, revisions and stuff like that yeah uh for ihs press indiana historical society press so that's one of the books i worked on so i like to touch on projects like that yeah. and kind of put them out there um another project that we briefly talked about earlier was uh chuck taylor mm -hmm. all-star which opened to the public last week uh they are uh historical society uh downtown indianapolis yeah uh, do not get it confused with the Indiana State Museum because <laughs> Indiana State Museum actually has a pair of Chuck Taylors that he, ah, yes. a pair of tennis shoes that Chuck Taylor wore. Okay. Now the historical has some of the earlier all-stars converse from like 1930s mm -hmm. all the way to, oh, cool. I mean, some really interesting artifacts and facts. Um, not a lot of people, you know, knew he was even from here. Yeah. From, uh, um, he went to Columbus high school, um, 
in his trajectory from being a, a basketball player to then a coach. He even coached a team through the World War II, one of the mm. service teams. And also what he's more known for is being a salesman for what was then Converse Rover Company. Yeah. So uh, in the 1930s, that's when they put his name on the shoe because- Oh, he that was, was in the 30s. Okay. In the 30s because he was a great salesman for them. Oh, that's and great. And he was out there. I mean, if you look at his story, it's amazing. He was out there, you know, every day just going places to places, connecting with almost every, you know, like college team, mm -hmm. providing them with, you know, orders of shoes and also improving the shoe itself. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I grew up in Puerto Rico wearing chucks. I didn't even know that. You know, for me, I, I thought he was like a 1970s player. Yeah, right. The name, yeah, Chuck I didn't, Taylor. I didn't know it was that old either. Yeah. I thought it was like a 50s, 60s. Yeah, I think he was born in 1901. Oh, um, wow. Passing, I, I believe, no 69 idea. or something like that. But, um, you know, it, it's a deep story. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing that I often look at where we are here in the space of, you know, Indiana, mm -hmm. right? We tend to be a town that we don't, we don't like to talk too much about things. So there's mm -hmm. like amazing stories. Um, uh, I recently went to a talk, which is kind of related to Indiana and stuff like that, where it was about, um, hip hop history. Mm. And after the talk, some of the, I was, I was not participating in the talk. I was one of the attendees, you know, um, uh, mm -hmm. spectators, right. In the yeah. crowd. So after the talk, someone that I've seen around say like, Hey, we started talking about certain things. And then she mentioned the song. Um, the message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious oh, Five. Uh -huh. And I say, you know, the guy who created the keyboard riff on that song is from Indianapolis. And she's like, what? Really? I didn't know that. I say, yeah, I forgot his last name. His first name is Reggie. And Kyle Long interviewed him. So uh -huh. look him up. And she's like, oh, my God, I didn't know that. And I say, yeah. So like the Mick Wilson has done, has contributed a lot. Yeah. That oftentimes because of, of the nature of, Midwesterns, it's like, mm -hmm. we work at it, but we're not the ones to take the glory for it. Yeah. Which is something coming from New York to Indy was a little hard for me mm -hmm. because New York, you know, for better or worse, we're talkers, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, we no just had somebody at the White House not too long ago. <laughs> we're talkers. We, you know, it's like, you know, any little thing that New Yorkers, for the most part, we put out, it's like, boom, yeah. it goes. And, you know, New York has broadcasting, publishing, you know, media. That's, you know, like the center for the most part, you know, of, of those marketing tools. So I can see why some of that is, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like you, 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 you own it. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. You've got this should be published, right? This should be front page in the New York times. Right. right? So, uh, you know, being here in the mid was just a little more, we do it, we mm -hmm. influence. So now that I'm older, I'm enjoying that. Yeah. Because, you know, you don't have to be in the forefront. And it's cool because there's no pressure. The forefront has a lot of pressures <laughs> and stresses. Yeah. You're not wrong about that. <laughs> uh, so you have transitioned uh, to teaching as kind of a it's, another yeah. big thing. It's not like... Yeah, and I think I mentioned, uh, you know, last time we 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 spoke about Paula Differin, who was always like mm -hmm. Sam, 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 Sam. So you know, now once I got in that space, I realized, oh, that's why I love school so much. Yeah. Right? And so right now, I'm I'm teaching a course at Heron, and it's it's uh for the visual communications department, but it's handmade graphic design, which is kind of interesting because with how technology and everything a lot of being done you know mm -hmm. online and stuff like that the sentiment of of the majority of the students is like great we you know it's like we spend so much time in front of the computers it's really nice to think outside of it yeah but also still utilizing some of the the tools of design research and you know prototyping and mm -hmm. all that and analyzing and doing all that so they're like okay it's more thinking Cause at first, you know, even a few think, oh, we're going to do, we're going to do yes, but you got to think about what you're going to do. Yeah. So it's not random. Uh, and I keep emphasizing that, you know, the more you know about a subject, when you present work, people can argue against it if you have the facts. Yeah, right. Um, cause a lot of 
art design and a whole bunch of other stuff is just done for reference mm -hmm. oh i like the color blue or red yeah but it has nothing to do with the subject you're designing so mm. it's all based on preference so i'm kind of like teaching them look at different things and always ask the question what if i do this or why is this the way this is yeah so those are things that i enjoy discussing with them you know i've heard it say, said that we um we make most of our decisions based on emotion but mm -hmm. we justify them with facts but the interesting thing is as a designer, as a creative, when you have a story behind something, it's really both. Yeah. So you're imbuing that emotion mm -hmm. and the facts of the thing. And it really kind of helps, again, yeah. when you're in a position of trying to sell a design or trying to sell a creative work or trying to get somebody else to say yes yeah. to what you yeah. want to do. Like that's the best way possible is and to teach it, I them mean, how to tell that story yeah. about the work. And knowing about the client. Yeah. Because that's one thing that, you know, uh, which... Where I'm at as a creative, I didn't know how to deal earlier on. Yeah. Where it was like, okay, I like all this fine art, mm -hmm. for example. And then I like, you know, the design. So one is subjective. The other one has is objective, right? Yeah. So how do I put those together? Now, sure. with what you mentioned, the emotion, you know, art has a lot of emotion. Oh, right. Design seems to be a little more tamed, right? Mm -hmm. But still has to connect. Sure. With the audience of the client. So bringing those two things, the emotion and so you, but it's not my emotion, it's the emotion of the client. Right. So that's why I have to understand the client. And even though I say, oh, I'm, I would love to do this for this client. Hold on. Let me gotta get out of the way of how I feel about something. And let me see what the client, mm -hmm. what they feel like, even about their product. Yeah. Because they know it better than me. So. Yeah. Totally makes sense. Yeah. Um. So you're a graduate of Heron. Yeah, 2010. Yeah, and then uh, somewhere in between there, I taught there for a minute, a couple of classes adjunct, and now, yeah. now you're back as, as an yeah, instructor there. Yeah, this is there. my third time <laughs> being back <laughs> at Heron teaching in that right. capacity. Yeah. What do you feel like is different this go around, or does it does it feel like, I mean, they've switched buildings and, and all those things. I'm sure the just the surroundings are different, but does yeah. teaching feel different this time around? I think it's with any anything it goes through through the its changes right because mm -hmm. you know different instructors bring different things yeah so as I you know peruse the hallways which I'm sure you did too yeah. and look at some of the branding projects and some of the stuff I'm like oh this part can be this part and I was talking yeah. uh, to my wife and I was like hold on there's something and she's like oh you're already analyzing and but I was <laughs> like I think. Those of us who've done it for a long time and look outside of where we are mm -hmm. for inspiration and seeing like, you know, there's, there's a few studios. So I look at their stuff and collect on um, their stuff. Like, you know, we we're talking about Paul Asher earlier yeah. uh -huh. and I collect a lot of the books they put out. Cause I mean, when it comes to typography, pentagram is one of those places oh, right. when it comes to publications, exhibitions, certain things, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, Pay close attention, which, um, to my class, I, I, um, I suggested to watch the abstract Polar Shirt episode, oh, uh -huh. which I watched it for oh, the first time not too long ago. So good. And I was like, I thought I knew everything about what she did mm -hmm. or how she did things. So it was interesting. And then one of those things where it's really cool, um, one guy who used to, uh, uh, Still screen some of the stuff for her was here in Indianapolis, which oh, right. I visited a while ago. And you probably I have two of his posters yeah. downstairs. Okay, cool. <laughs> he had a shop. Yeah. Yeah. And he's you know, how I met him was through he was doing a job through for Young and Lar uh yeah, Young and Laramore. Yeah. And Cody Thompson, who used to work for us back in the day, had introduced yeah. me to so to here, him here it is, yeah. Full, you know, Indianapolis. Gum and, moment, right? Yep, <laughs> and, she, and he's doing stuff for you know Paul Asher and printing some posters. Yeah. So it, it's really interesting to to see that you know that, that exists here. Um, I even uh, watched the it was a while back they did a objectified documentary. Mm. Oh yeah, and you know. There was a Heron, you know, former Heron student there that uh, he's over, I think, at the Walker. Andrew Blaubel, Blaubel uh -huh. or something. Yeah. yeah. So I said, hey, he was a Heron student. And they're like, huh? I say, yeah. So there's there's this, um, 
you know, things that, I, you know, I'm teaching and say, look outside of where we are, because mm -hmm. that's how we learn by seeing what other people have done. Yeah. And what works. So, you know, that's one thing I was like, mm. but that's the, you know, the perfectionist in me that mm -hmm. I've kind of, I ha I still have that, but I also see that, that, you know, perfection is something you cannot attain. So, you yeah. know, but you know, you can attain excellence. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Man, that is something that I've definitely struggled with. Perfectionism <laughs> is my own flavor of self-sabotage where I, uh, I don't know if you deal with this flavor in particular, but mm -hmm. for me, it's, um, I call it perfectionist procrastination. So it's like, if I have a deadline, I'm on it and I'm firing on all, all cylinders. Mm -hmm. And if I've got any slack in the system, I will wait. wait until it's a hard deadline and then I can fire again. It's like my brain won't let me yeah, go yeah. all in until it matters. Yeah. Do you deal with that at all? I, I mean, I, my dad was, you know, military and he ran the house. <laughs> it was a <laughs> boot camp. Uh, we couldn't wear like tennis shoes out in part, oh, you know, like wow. going out to the mall. Uh -huh. We had to dress in our Sunday's best. So it, it was one of those things where it was like, he himself didn't wear like tennis shoes until he was like in his, early forties. Oh, wow. Everything I saw was like shoes and dress pants and yeah. blah, blah. So, um, Pressed yeah, I grew up and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think with, you know, graffiti at first, it was kind of like a little taste of something that, you know, it was more of a release of an expression and not so much trying to pin down and have everything, yeah. you know, down to the T. But once I got into design, I think that's why I enjoyed it because it was like, okay, now I have, everything has to be mm. precise. And then mm -hmm. with the computer coming in and you can just go, oh, this has to be 0.25 <laughs> and the X and the Y and in every page is at the same spot or master pages and, yeah. and everything became that. And then once I got into fine arts, I struggled Yeah, because it was one of those things where for like 10 years, my mind was so regimented. You know, on something that's precise and having the computer that can give you, yeah, you know, as far as what you produce on it. Once it goes out and goes to the printer, it's a whole different story. Right. They don't always cut paper straight <laughs> <That's> <laughs> or right. the ink don't come out right. But, you know, that's out of my control. But, you know, coming into fine arts, I was, I remember just, and I don't know if I mentioned this when we talked last, that mm -hmm. I had some blank surfaces in front of me for like two months. Yeah. Every morning I would look at them, walk away mm -hmm. for like two months. I did that every morning because my mind was like, I wanted to see something and I wanted to control the outcome to the T. Isn't that interesting? So the whole idea of procrastinating yeah. is, is, is paralyzing. Uh -huh. So that's when I realized I was like, oh no, this is paralyzing me because I already want to see an outcome. So the first thing I said is just like, let me just throw a mark. And mm -hmm. I remember I just did like one <laughs> on each surface. And I said, okay, that's a star. But it took me, it was right side there with that mark yeah. for like another week. Mm -hmm. Then came back and did a second mark. Yeah. And I think it was mentally I had to break those, you know, grids yeah. and formats and say, I don't have to see the final outcome from the beginning because I haven't started the process yet. Yeah. So I think it was, it was one of those things where it really did. So it took a, couple of months to to get there so one of the things that i i like to ask guests on the show is mm -hmm. if they have any favorite pieces of advice that they've received or maybe especially with your students advice that you regularly find yourself passing on yeah. anything come to mind i think this is more like a it, it can apply to students or anything but i'm seeing more in my personal life it's like yeah. you know like the last couple of years even though i've touched project i've kind of kept away from things like I haven't done a, a solo show in six years. Yeah. I haven't shown new visual artwork in four. So I think for me, it's like, take time for yourself, enjoy life outside of that. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, the, it, it can be very, you know, almost like tonal vision mm -hmm. and you don't see outside of that. And inspiration comes from life. So I'm, I'm, I'm now taking and say, let me take care of myself and those yeah. that I love a little better. Um, cause at the end of the day, it's like, 
That's what makes life really enjoyable. Yeah. You, you can just do the simplest thing and enjoy. What do you find? Um, so you and I share a lot of things. I mean, I, I feel like you creatively have more areas where you express yourself in a more professional mm -hmm. capacity. But I, I always joke, I like to do all the things and people are like, what are you up to now? I'm like, it's going to take me 20 minutes just to catch you up on all the, <laughs> yeah. all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, one of the challenges that, that I used to have really was like, okay, how do I wind down or what do I do for me or what do I do for fun? That's not making. Yeah. And do you have, is there anything that, oh, that what, like, what are your favorite things to do to unwind? I mean, this, <laughs> this might sound like the most like what? But it's literally that winding down. Like I will, I will sit literally. And I, I think early on, I, I did this for, for like about six months mm -hmm. where I say, I want no TV, no radio. Mm -hmm. And after work, I will just lay whether back on the bed or somewhere for hours, not sleeping in total silence. Yeah. So, you know, I enjoy time myself yeah uh, there's times where i just you know you can find me at any coffee shop and i could be there one time i spent seven hours in a starbucks drinking coffee just looking at people seven mm -hmm. hours so i am comfortable in doing that and just like stopping yeah. sitting and not doing anything but just enjoying that moment that's pretty incredible you know and i i do it just about now, like three days a week, mm -hmm. I can find a, a coffee shop and just sit there for a couple of hours and just, okay. Yeah. Because there's, there's so much clutter out there. Uh -huh. Um, even with like social media, that's, you know, which I, I understand the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. Right. But you know, um, the older you get, you're like, do I really want to spend that time there? Right. Or I will put posts and then I take them down. If you go to my you know, my, you know, which I have a private is just like three posts right now. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like, for me, not everybody, but for me, it's like, yes, I can talk about projects that I've done, but if you come to my time feed, do I want to, you know, like take up your time with you looking at something I did, you know, 10 years ago yeah. on Instagram? No, do stuff. Go out there and do <laughs> stuff. If you want to know that, take the time. Go to my website. I got a pretty good documentation. But as far as in that in that platform, I just like to just and it's more for inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's why I have the hashtag cultural. I think it's psychic. I don't know how to even pronounce it, but you know the whole idea. And I study, and it's like oh, okay, it was some. It was the spirit of the time. Oh yeah. Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, but I put culture in front of it. Yeah. Cool. And Zeitgeist. to me, it's like the spirit of the time. Well, it, mm -hmm. you know, we have the present, you know, like I tell people a second ago was the past. We're in the present, but the present a second ago become, became yeah. the past. So, you know, it move, time moves. So what's now is now. So I think with my Instagram feed, it's just like, I could share a little blur. It could be there for like, you know, a week. It will disappear because mm -hmm. it's okay. You got the info. Let's move <laughs> on. And I think it's, it's, it's some of my pet peeves. Yeah. I, I don't like to dwell too much on what I've done. Yeah. Because it's like, there's so much still to do mm -hmm. and we're doing in the present. So yeah. Yeah. Love it. Uh, well maybe talking about the future. Mm -hmm. what what's on the horizon for you or what are you looking uh, forward to oh there's there's a few projects you know it's always it's kind of they always take fruition um i've had a friend who you know she has for for a while say like sam you you've organized exhibitions you know you like to feature artists you know and this is something that's just like with paula yeah uh, different saying sam you sam sam yeah. it usually takes you know years down the road but she said, have you ever thought of opening your own space? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of like managing artists? And it's a lot of artists here in town that I'll just, I say, whatever, you know, let me know. I'll send you a PDF with what I do. Yeah. And some people say, Hey, you should do workshops. I'm like, why? <laughs> they can learn this stuff online. But if they had come to me and say, here's a PDF, this is how I organize this. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Go ahead. Do it with it. So, um, that idea of a space is something that's been around mm -hmm. 
for a couple of years and there's some projects. It's a new book project that I'm working with a friend of mine, which is really interesting. It's really related to the creative renewal, um, fellowship and mm-hmm. also tie into a scholar in residence at IUPUI arts and humanities. Oh, cool. They kind of spearheaded the first, um, phase of research. So those are things that, you know, they're, I'm working on those things. Nice. Yeah. And then you're, uh, you're toying with the idea of Toronto eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just kind of like, I have not, you know, this is the first time people publicly hear Toronto, yeah, right. which is, but it's one of those things where, you know, um, just looking around. Cause even when I was in New York, I had applied for, for a year residency in Rome, mm-hmm. Italy. And did not get that one, but then the shutdown happened. Oh, right. So it was like, oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Probably God, good. I didn't get, you know, really. it was one of those like <laughs> right. blessings in this guy where right. he wanted something, it didn't happen. And then it's like, uh uh-uh, uh, shutdown happened. <laughs> right. So the idea of having a uh, space, a creative space in other places. Yeah. And I think it's more of like understanding different cultures. Like uh-huh. Toronto is, you know, it's, it seemed to be a little more closer to Europe. You know, mm-hmm. being, you know, under <laughs> the queen or the king <laughs> right. as far as, you yes. know, being part of, of, of the British empire. But, you know, the idea that you have all these different cultures there, mm-hmm. Toronto is a more of an open international city, yeah. which Indianapolis is becoming more and more yeah. with the airport, mm-hmm. now having more direct flights and the community is here, the international community, everybody's international. That's what I like to say. Yeah. Right. We're no longer. Yes. Cause for people outside of here, we're international, right? It's true. Yeah. So <laughs> the whole world is international. And, but the idea of being in those spaces and getting to, to see all the cultures always kind of like, um, it piques my interest. Yeah. Food, music, language, just how people live and, you know, and I, I think I'm like an old, you know, old soul where I would love to have a little apartment someplace and just go downstairs and there's, oh, oh yeah. I can grab bread over here in the corner. Or I can, you know, my vegetables over there. So it's yeah. not like the big box idea of. It's of, very uh, romantic. Yeah, way yeah. Of, yeah. But I think this, you know, the way I move about, it's like, you know, a lot of, I don't, I'm not, how you call that? I don't spend a lot of money. <laughs> like my wife sometimes is like, uh, babe, you be wearing those same shoes or you be wearing that same shirt. I say it fits, it works. I'm good. <laughs> you know, um, I cut my own hair. I haven't been in a barber in like 30 <laughs> years. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it's, so I like that idea of, of a very simple existence. And oftentimes, for you, as you know, yeah. to do your work, there's a lot of stuff you have to like get rid of. Oh yeah, you know, and distractions and things. And that's why, like, right now, my studio is not open to the public. Mm-hmm. And I used to have a studio at the Harrison, and it was great. People came and all that, but after a while, it's like for me, yeah. it's too, you know, distractions too much. Right. So I, I, I said I'd rather work my own pace and then when the work is ready, share it with the world. So I'll, I'll be interested to go back and hear what your answer mm-hmm. was last time, because we always ask everybody who's on the show, the same question, and this can be life or creativity or art or anything you like, yeah. but, but I'm curious what it is you find that you are most obsessed with right now. I got you. <laughs> Publishing. Publishing. Yeah. And you know, having, you know, like put a work with, with IHS for us and some of the, the publications there and stuff like that, you know, it's a lot of pu- about publishing that mm-hmm. it's new to me, mm. you know, like even reading, cause I have to read manuscripts. Like I also lay out, uh, their quarterly publication. Mm-hmm. So I'm there reading and making notes okay this goes with this photo and also but seeing how you're a graphic designer who's reading the content yeah because (laughs) you have to and that's one thing that when it comes with publications it's one of those things where it's like if i'm giving 10 photos for this article when i'm reading the article the photo has to relate to it Mm -hmm. so i read the article and this is you know my, my process right yeah i read the article and i will like 
Well, I will print out the photos, mark them, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Mm -hmm. I read the article as I memorize the photos, their titles, what they are, mm -hmm. the subject in the photo. And then as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, yeah. Photo number one, go see your photo 10, whatnot. Yeah. Now, you know, I can be a little more old school when it comes to like laying things out. Uh, oftentimes, the way you get text is like, it could be the whole publication or different, depending how it is. If it's a book, they might have, you have like 43 chapters. There's yeah. a book I'm working on now for a, a poet laureate. And it's like 43 chapters in one text file. Yeah. It's a big boy. So it's like, I cannot import this whole thing with the, you know, the formats and stuff. So I have to copy and paste. So mm -hmm. I, I read 43, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> chapters and I'm highlighting like italics. Yeah. So then I can go back and do it. I know there might be an easier way to do yeah. it, but you know, that's my process. So, and I make notes all over it. So that's, those are the things that I'm learning more and more about publishing. Also about sentence structure and how people write things. Yeah. So right now, which I have it in my bag, I'm rewriting incisive, which is the book I wrote about my path. Mm. And I'm going back and going, oh my God, no, this needs to go out because <laughs> the, the sentence structure is horrible. It should be yeah. a period. I have like three thoughts in one sentence. So, you know, I'm rewriting it and I'm going to republish, you know, a revised edition. Oh, cool. So it's been four years since, since that one was published. Uh, I have new work since then, so I will extend the back of it. Oh, right. Because um, it ended in uh, the chapter was the new New York. Because that's one thing I realized about New York when I went in 2019. It's mm -hmm. like, this is not the New York I left. And I, I was not expecting it to be. But to see where it, where it, where it is and where it was, right? I was kind of like, it, it was one of those things where it's like, oh, the soul is not there. Mm -hmm. As I knew it. But as an adult, I can appreciate where it is. Yeah. Cause it's like, okay, the seventies and eighties, that era is gone. Right. There's only so much, uh, abandoned buildings that your mind can take before yeah. you, right. you know, go off the rails. <laughs> so I'm like walking through Harlem. Oh, outdoor cafe. Cool. Or Brooklyn. I'm like, this used to be where the mob used to throw the bodies. Now it's yeah. Dumbo, beautiful space where I yeah. was. So, you know, it's like, okay, I can, I can enjoy it from from that perspective and saying, so, mm. you know, there's, there's that level of, of, uh, of appreciation, you know, for that. So with publishing, I'm doing the same thing. Um, you know, just looking at it and saying, okay, I gotta get, and it's, it's that whole idea of constantly learning. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I've, you know, as far as for students, something that I will say, it's like, which it was, you know, it's probably what's passed down to you. Um, you know, it's like, Learn are somebody else's expense, right. meaning do internships, right? Meaning, uh, you know, you, if, if it's a job like I've done, you know, work as a, you know, art director, then the next job was production designer because mm -hmm. I wanted to learn yeah. something. So the idea of like learn, because especially when they're paying you for it, right? Why not? Yeah. Take I mean, somebody like you or I probably could have been successful eventually just going out on our own to start with. But, mm -hmm. you know, I was in a position of like, I didn't, I knew that I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of the things that you, um, it, listeners, if you get that noise in the background, that's every Friday at 11 a.m. on uh, in Indianapolis, we sound the everything's okay alarm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it used to be a whole the, different uh, sound, I think. Yeah. It's a little that thing freaked little, me out the first Friday. Yeah, I was, a little higher pitched here in here in Carmel. The but, first Friday out, I I was in Indianapolis from New York. Yeah, I was like, "What the heck is that?" <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it it adds to the to the vibe of the podcast. I think <laughs> it lets us know we're still in kind of like That's a right. little bit of tornado alley. Yeah, for sure. Not a lot, but for sure, it can happen. Uh, but anyhow, like co mm -hmm. coming out of school, not knowing. I didn't know that I needed to learn how to sell. I didn't need, know that I needed to learn how to pitch. My, you know, we had done critiques and things, but, yeah. I did, but that was a whole nother level. Yeah, I think things. it was, it's the whole idea of like, and, and that's where it comes to when I look at portfolios of student or reviews, right? Mm -hmm. I say, wow, great. Design is there. Mm -hmm. Now 
you have to learn, you know, it's going to look a lot different once you have the client input. Yeah. Right. And that's why we say fake projects or real. You know? <laughs> right. So the idea of working with clients, even that's one, one good thing with hair and they have the uh, studio practice. Yeah. Which I was able to be assistant teacher assistant with Paula. And that was the mm -hmm. last class that, right. uh, through Christopher Vice, he said, you already have a portfolio. You don't need one. You've worked in the field. Mm -hmm. You know, Paula has been wanting you to teach. So, you know, you can assist during that class. You know, I was able to even connect students with clients and have them. And there were some conflicts at some point. We basically had her like say to a client, we cannot work with you because mm -hmm. even that. So, but you know, being in school, everything is rosy, right? Like, right. oh yeah, I can do whatever. It's like, but you're not having the client's input. So that selling part, or even that's, that's part of creativity because it's like that knowing that relationship of client and, you know, designer and mm -hmm. how to go through that, through that is, it's a whole different sphere. Yeah. The, the thing that they don't, they don't teach you in school is how much your design might evolve yeah. based on the client's input, you mm -hmm. know, because, um, you know, they're going to come back with changes. They're going to come back with requirements that you didn't know about when the project started. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you this needs to fit in a mailer or we forgot to tell you this needs to ship by March or we forgot to tell you this blah, 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 blah. So yeah, there's some other, um, or Bob in accounting just saw it Yeah, and he some, hates red. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's a lot of conditions outside your control, right? Yeah. That come into play. And cause I remember when I first started and this was back in 97, the yeah. first, uh, um, full-time design job that I had Yeah, where I will sit in meetings and I'll be like really quiet. And also, do you have questions? I'm be like shaking my head. Yeah. Like, no, don't even, don't ask me that because <laughs> don't put me on the spot. And now when I go into meetings, oftentimes, you know, like when I come out, other creators, other people say like, why would you say that? I say, no, we got to be true about things. Mm -hmm. We ha we need to discover. That's why that discovery meeting is so important. It's right. like, what's your budget? Let me see this. Let me see that. What's the time frame? What's this? What's that? You know, because those things you know, can throw a wrench into the whole mix. And all of a oh, sudden totally. it's, it's just like a project that can go. And there's no, there's very few projects that go the way you think they will, they're going to go as far as the planning and the execution of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Oftentimes it's with other creatives Yeah, because, you know, we kind of, we speak a certain language yeah. and we can go, okay, cool. We don't have to be in control of everything. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, when you know, somebody can, can work in that capacity, but when it comes to a client, it's like, okay. And the communication part is so is very important. Um, you know, like I mentioned last time, I don't like designing by committee. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, due to the clients, that's the only part. But I say, let me communicate with one person there. Yeah. You take it, talk to the committee, come back and tell me this is some of the changes they want, then we yeah. can discuss it and stuff like that. But because my, one of my pet peeves is like people who are not designers should not be making design decisions. <laughs> right. So they say like, Hey, like for example, a recent project I worked on, it's like, Hey, we want an invitation for this event. And you know, so it was a book launch, right? Mm -hmm. Lily, Lily, uh, family oh, yeah. did a book about uh, three generations. So they needed to put an invitation. I'm like, cool. I lay out beautiful invitation. You know, it's just like the type is very macular, blah, blah. Came back saying, uh, well, we've always done it this way. Uh, and what was shown to me was more of a postcard mm -hmm. than an invitation. Yeah. So I said, oh, you want me to design a postcard? No, no, it's an invitation. No, what you're showing me is a postcard. Right. A postcard has large type. Big, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it, it doesn't have that very intimate invitation of like, oh, wow, they took time right. to create this to a, to the sense of like, I don't want to throw this away. Right. Postcard, you can throw throw away if you want to. Right. So those are things that, you know, oftentimes as hard as we become educators, even to clients, which, you know, um, unless I really, really like what they're doing, they're, they're event or product or whatnot, mm -hmm. I'd rather not waste time educating somebody as far as like, Hey, I'm the designer, you're the client. 
Mm-hmm. We can come together. You bring your client stuff. I bring my design stuff. Yeah, right. And we meet in the middle and we create something great. But don't try to make design decisions because uh, they're not, you know, versed in that. Yeah. So that's always a fight in a sense that mm-hmm. we creators have with uh, with certain clients and stuff like that. So of all the projects you've done and all the projects that you have cooking, do you have any like ultimate dream projects still out there that you're, you know, one of mine is like, I keep putting out into the universe. I'd, lo- I'd love to do yeah. branding for an airline because I think there's nothing cooler than seeing your identity system yeah, fly by that, every 20 minutes. But and, um, I mean, the whole idea there's a, they have been amazing designers that have yeah, worked on yeah, brands like some, that. And, some really great Massimo Vignelli and, yeah, and all of them, you know. Yeah. Like, and um, ultimate project. Um, I mean, this is something that I've always been interested in and it's something that, um, you know, I like more of the visual of it than actually like work, you know, like producing it. I probably Mm -hmm. would love to do more like creative or getting that space. It's like film. Mm -hmm. And I think with working on the Sidney Pollack book and just looking about how he, he went about his, you know, craft, Mm -hmm. like the projects that he selected and stuff like that. I was like, Wow, that's really interesting. Um, topic wise, I I think it would be more on inspiration. Um, mm-hmm. th- there's some series of uh, short films. Um, I think I call them short films or something. Uh, Monocle, which is that publication, mm-hmm. and they will put out some really cool about a shoemaker in Japan yeah. or a restaurant in you know Norway. And I always and my friend Achu. He's the one who uh-huh. introduced me to that. And, yeah. You know, I choose does furniture and design. So here's somebody that I collaborate with a lot who has those ideas. Right? Yeah. So, you know, in my sense, it's like, yeah, I would love to be part of the creative crew that puts out all this amazing content that inspires people. Yeah. Um, you know, the always, the thing with that is like my other side says, Keep that a secret. Let those who know know <laughs> right. because once you put it out, it can change the dynamic of it, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, it's like the idea that you are inspiring somebody else. You know, that should be the that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I love like that. some really cool film. And there's a an actual um, one of the artists who was featured in in an expression. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in the in the documentary uh, "Beautiful Losers." Uh, Mike, what's his last name? Mike is his first name. I okay, his last name. we'll look him up. Put that in the show notes. He is uh, married to uh, uh, Miranda July. He was a writer, but he uh, he was in Beautiful Losers and uh, and also Chris Rubino. He is a designer and he's doing amazing. Like. I mean, nowadays you see some of the stuff he's doing, he's doing like short films Mm -hmm. and, you know, like, um, Mike, what's he just recently, uh, work, I think it was Mike or, or Chris work with, uh, Joaquin Phoenix on a film that was, uh, released by a two four, a 24. Yeah. And I mean, it's just to see that space because we saw it with like, you know, um, uh, what was the 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 film that the the shower scene? Oh, Psycho. Psycho, where it yeah. was it was it was directed by uh, was it Saul Bass? Bass yeah. yeah. So to see a creative person that we almost see him as, oh, you just do branding and graphics. Yeah. But that's an extension. Yeah. And that's one thing, like, um, you know, I was recently asked a question, which is, you know, in, in a branding project, I, you know, they're interesting, but the 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 topic has to be really interesting. Like you say, an, air, an airline. I mean, yeah. that's like, wow, okay, that's cool. That's right. an interesting. So I think subject-wise, I still haven't found that subject mm-hmm. that I will say that will be my ultimate branding. Yeah. You know, uh, oftentimes, you know, like some of, you know, the branding projects I've seen at Heron is like the Olympics, mm. right? And I see some of the stuff and it's like, okay, it, it's a beginning. But I think, you know, the Olympics is one of those things where it has so many moving parts that it's like, yeah. It's a monster project. The branding <laughs> has to fit, you know, hunt, you know, I don't know how many 
couple of hundreds of events and yeah, venues right. and, you know, sponsors and all this. So it's like one student sitting in the classroom will not, you know, just say, just yeah. do research on yeah. it. Work on the research part and then, you know, let that be your entry point to it. And mm -hmm. I say, I'm going to create a branding because, yeah, the reality of that, like you say, is just, it's to another hemisphere. Um, so as far as a branding project, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, it has, it hasn't really like crossed my mind Okay, in a sense. But I like the film idea. I think, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm in line with that too. Been experimenting a little in the photo and mm -hmm. film side here recently, and having having fun yeah. with that. So I think you got be... you got to you got to shoot some shots. Yeah, with me. Like, yeah, well, yeah, well, you, I mean, your stuff round. is good. Your stuff is good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll yeah. have to have you back just for a portrait shoot. There you go. That'd be fun. Uh, well, hey, before we let you go, tell our listeners where they can find Offerta and heirs and lovers and all the other things yeah, that you have coming yeah. out. And of course the Sydney Pollock book will be out soon. Yeah. Where, where do we find all the things, Sam? So, uh, with the Sydney Pollock book, uh, through the Indiana historical society, which their web website is Indiana history.org. Mm -hmm. Um, you click on the shop, it should be there pretty soon. Um, the historical society also has just opened up Chuck Taylor, all star. Mm. And that runs through January of 2025. So oh, wow. It's a long so it'll be a long run. Nice. And one, one cool thing about that is uh, next year, 2024, uh, Indianapolis is hosting the NBA All-Star. Oh, yeah. So, so that'll get a lot of traffic. They're going to have it during that time. And there's going to cool. be some really interesting events that they're planning uh, for that. Um, you know, whether I'm part of some of that planning or not, it's like, Hey, I did my part and, you know, it's really cool to just <laughs> right. kind of, you know, just sometimes leave things where they are, Yeah, you know, and, and, and being just one piece of the puzzle in that project, um, Oferta, uh, they can find it at Oferta mag, mm -hmm. uh, mag dot com. So Oferta with two F's, mm -hmm. um, then errors and lovers. Mm -hmm. So SoundCloud, that's, I mean, I was told to put my stuff on Spotify and I'm still trying to figure that out, but yeah. it's like, I don't know. I like that SoundCloud is just upload. That's it. Yeah. I don't have to go Pretty through simple. like all these other channels to do that. So errors and lovers, errors underscore and A and D underscore lovers uh -huh. on SoundCloud. So they can, you know, I probably got like 50 tracks there and continue experimenting. And then my visual arts is uh, Samuel E. Vasquez dot net. And then I also have a, the, the first time after all these years, I finally put up a design website, which I share with you, the work yeah. of SV uh -huh. dot com. Uh, right now I'm working on, on some projects that I'm, I'm connecting with some people. So my portfolio is password protected. Okay. But I will, once those projects are <laughs> done, then I'll open it up to the public. And those other things, you know, sometimes I think with social media, there's too much that share up front and yeah. oftentimes that don't let for the project to fully develop, yeah, fully cooked. Um, and those are the things I like to do. It's like, no, let the project fully cooked. And once it's there, then say, here it is. Yeah. And, you know, that's the beauty of it. Everybody doesn't have to see the, you know, work in progress. Yeah. You awesome. know. Yep. Well, Sam, it was great catching up with you again. Definitely. Having you here at the house. Yeah. And uh, thank you once again for being on the show. And thank you for being obsessed with design. And life and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> nice work. Yep. Okay, kids. That's episode number 175 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. 
Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.